Thank you for joining us on Frightening Frauen. It's Tyler and Lee. Woo! I almost said <laughs> Lee for myself. <laughs> I'm so oh awkward my. about it that, you know, that might work. It might. I'm Lee. <laughs> Let's see if they notice. No. <laughs> we'll play opposite day. Um, let me turn my sound off in case anything happens. So, tell us about your day, Lee. <laughs> Well, uh, it feels like somebody punched me in the butt. <laughs> Tell us about it. <laughs> I, uh, I got a, a steroid injection in my piriformis muscle on the right side. And they literally put like five cc's of like this fluid in there with the steroids and everything. And you can feel as it's going in, the pressure gets more and more. And you're like, oh, you know, because the muscle goes. That's Rrr. a lot. Yeah, That's so now it, it literally feels like, like when I was a teenager, my friends and I, we'd punch each other, give each other Charlie horses. That's what it feels like. Um, That's not the worst feeling. I kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not awful. I've had them before where it was like a really sharp radiating pain, and this time it's more mellow. And she did that. She tried to put it in a slightly safer spot because she knew I'd be driving. Mm. Um, yeah. But yeah, so... But that's cool. It'll I'll, I'll probably have mood swings in like three days from the steroids, and then um, usually Good thing I we're not recording. Yeah, in three days. <laughs> I usually get really like manic. I get like, <gasps> but then like sometimes I'll get like angry. Um, I don't. I'm not prone to sadness, so that's not usually one of my swings. So <laughs> as as we're recording this, the new episode of uh, Futurama came out yesterday, and it was a COVID episode. But the new like thing like they just solved covid and it was like you're 3023 uh-huh <laughs> they finally <laughs> they finally did and then a new uh, thing came up that same day and it made people really angry mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was a virus that was like highly contagious that just makes you angry <laughs> it just reminded me of that but i need to watch that I kind of like, like, the new episodes aren't super exciting. Like, they're no different than the old episodes, but yeah. I like I like that there's something new, and I yeah. do like the characters, so I'm just ha- As long as they stay true to, like, what they were already doing, then I'm happy. If they try to, like, make mm-hmm. it into something else, then I'll be like, err. No, so you'll really like it, because it's like, they just continued it. There's nothing different at all. They act almost like they didn't change anything and they just continued awesome that's that's a, exactly perfect yeah good so job you'll, guys you'll <laughs> like it uh yeah there's other people were wanting something exciting and new and different and i kind of i like that it's just like new you won't even tell like when you're watching it through again and then the new ones start it doesn't seem like anything changed yeah so. that's that to me makes perfect sense like yeah no new characters no <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if you tried to get, like, Magic Bob's Burgers didn't do anything for a couple of years, and then they came back and tried to do something wildly different, people would be like, no. Oh, yeah. No. No. I would not like that. (laughs) bad. Bob's Burgers was not my favorite until recently. I started watching it again, and now I have a new appreciation for it. Yeah, I think I w- when I tried to watch it before, I think I was in my trying to be a grown up era. <laughs> um, I haven't done that one yet. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a weird era of time, but I was still watching Adventure Time, so makes yeah. sense of it. I don't know. It's, I was like, it's, this is Bob's Burgers, a very particular type of dry humor, and I definitely have to be in the right mood. But when I'm in the right mood, it's like. The most perfectest thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And that's me at night when I want to go to sleep and feel good for a little bit. <laughs> and feel better about my life. But. <laughs> my favorite episode is still the one where they have the pictures of animal butts on the wall. <laughs> I want those portraits. <laughs> I bet somebody's made them. I'm sure. There's <laughs> sure. just something beautiful about an animal butthole. <laughs> It just like literally took me back to horseback riding <laughs> when you're behind someone else and the horse and the just the tail farts. lifts <laughs> yeah the tail lifts and then it like puckers at you like it's blowing you a kiss and then it's all <sighs> you know <laughs> my friend just got asked from her website 
if uh and she'll know her her boyfriend listens to the podcast i don't know if she does but he a guy asked her if she could make her her butthole pucker for them and she had to look up like how people even do that and then was like no i'm not doing that for you (laughs) Hi. You, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I want to Google that. But don't. Okay. Just the horse thing's the same. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how I would recreate like a horse doing that. So I think you have to like practice in yeah. a mirror. I don't think I want that dedication. <laughs> no, I, I was pretty freaked out when I was like giving birth to my son, and they brought a mirror in to show me. Why? And, Why would they do that? And I was all, that's what my butthole looks like. And then the doctor's like, you know, like, <laughs> that was the first thing I thought of. And she's like, no, you can see his head like starting to come out. And I'm like, but my butthole. Like, <laughs> I also don't want to see myself like that. <laughs> right? Yeah, I was like, well, you can remove that now. Thank you. My, my aunt filmed me giving birth to, I believe, my second child. And thank God if there is one the light shining down perfectly just made it white right there. <laughs> yeah, like a built-in sensor. <laughs> the nope filter. So you can't even see anything. It's just... <laughs> I thank her for doing that for me or thinking that I would want that. <laughs> I have never watched it except for right afterwards just to see like how bad it was. And I'm like, I'm glad I don't know how bad it was. Yeah. They tried to bring me a mirror with the with the first one, and I didn't look. <laughs> yeah, like don't do that to me. I'm eighteen. <laughs> like, right? I don't want to see that. What has been seen cannot be unseen. <laughs> I've heard of husbands seeing their wives in labor and like never being able to look at them the same again, and that is not fair. <laughs> yeah, but I also somewhat understand. <laughs> yeah. I feel like, you know, if a guy can't get over it to the point that he can't have sex with his partner anymore, then, like, he probably needs therapy or something because he objectifies women way too much. Definitely. But, like, but having, like, a temporary, like, shock status because of, like, this whole experience and the fact that the body does this crazy, amazing, disturbing thing, you know, that's totally valid, you know, but you gotta... And then you need to get into worshipping a little bit and be like, whoa, you know? It went back? What? <laughs> it did that and it made that and what? Yeah. And and for all of you out there, it does go back. Yep. <laughs> Sorry um, for our lovely medical talk here, but the story isn't much better today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I didn't make it too graphic, but the images in your mind are probably worse than my words today. <laughs> and I bet that you've actually heard of this person today. I guess we'll find out. I think you have. Uh, but I do have funny news. Oh. <laughs> funny news. And I think you somewhat brought this one up yes, or yeah, yesterday, our last recording. <laughs> Um, did you bring up the Nebraska police issue citation to driver with bull riding shotgun I, in the car? I did. <laughs> yes. I found the story. <laughs> and it's not that far from me. <laughs> it's my neighbor in Nebraska. It's going to go on the the law books as one of those weird laws of things you can't do with, with animals. You know, there's like, I can't remember what state it is. It was like Wyoming or something. It's like you can't. You can't park your buffalo on top of a fire hydrant or something like that. There's like a real, and you, and you got to be like, what happened to cause <laughs> that law to be added into the book? There's <laughs> one about walking a giraffe in one state as well. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who, <laughs> who had a giraffe that they were walking? Right? <laughs> Uh, But some police officer, uh, with an S at the end, it didn't come out of my mouth, in Nebraska, (laughs) there were more than one, (laughs) recently had the weirdest traffic stop ever, and that's no bull. (laughs) 
sorry. Actually, there was a bull. Oh, this writer is great. Um, <laughs> do you want to come work for our podcast? <laughs> All right. Uh, and it was riding shotgun in a car along Route 275 near no- Norfolk. There's a Norfolk, Nebraska. On Wednesday morning. Uh, Norfolk police officers responded to a call about a vehicle with a cow inside. Rolling through the town assumed they, and was assumed that they would encounter a small animal. Uh, they thought small that it was going... Yeah, like a calf. They thought it was going to be a calf or something small or something that would actually fit inside of a vehicle. The captain of the police force said... Instead, they saw Howdy Doody, a full-size Watusi bull. I don't know how to pronounce that. Watusi? Hmm. Owned by Lee Meyer of Nilai. High five to the Lee. <laughs> Lee! <laughs> Spelt the way it always wants to misspell your name when I do the subtitles. <laughs> or, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. L-E-E. <laughs> Um, Raymond said the officers carried out a traffic stop and addressed some traffic violations that were occurring with that particular situation. Meyer was only given a warning, not a moving violation. (laughs) (laughs) I I love that they put a bunch of O's in there. Sorry, guys. Laugh break. <laughs> <laughs> and asked to take Howdy Doody back home and out of the city. <laughs> Taking him out for the sights or what? Had he done this before and never been caught? Like, <laughs> what? How did he even get the bull in there? And how did the bull oh, like? Let's see if you can see the picture. Okay, let's see if it'll focus. <laughs> Like, like special designed this car, so if you can't see on the visual, you should go over to YouTube. It, and look sh- at the it totally, sh- yeah, it's it, wow. And like, and the bull like did it not get angry at red cars? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, where? We, oh, is that the end? I think that was the end. He was he was asked to take it home. Yeah, that's <laughs> and keep wow. it out of the city. <laughs> I feel like if that happened here, you he would have gotten arrested. Yeah, that has big yeah. horns, too. That's yeah. a long horn bull. They and must be I like good how, buddies. I like how the horns on his car are, like, tiny. <laughs> yeah, that was, like, what I saw the first time. That's what got... I saw the little ones, and then I saw the big honking ones, and I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> gonna have to upgrade when that bull loses a bullfight. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Ferdinand <laughs> oh my oh there's some happy news before our weird horrible story today moving violation <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh alright so do you know who Elizabeth Bathory is mm, not by name the blood, de- the blood countess Mm-mm. Okay. Some parts of this will probably like peak your memories of certain stories cuz a lot of stories have taken from her real story for movies and books and different things that we learned about in school. Mm-hmm. But I never really learned her Sorry. real story. In school. <laughs> I'm st- I'm st- <laughs> I've still got the giggles in there. They're trying I'm just like staying. <laughs> okay, we'll get them out for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't going to do this story until later on. I did want to do her event. Do her. <laughs> I did want. I don't want to do her. I don't want to do her. <laughs> warning, warning. She was said to be beautiful, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm safe because I wasn't a 10 to 14 year old girl, but. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she'd want me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but last week we did one that was a little more historical with a lot of dates and places and stuff. This one's more colorful and, uh, 
she's evil. <laughs> Tr- not trigger warning, but spoiler alert: she's evil. And the one next week um, will be someone else who's not evil. So <laughs> I <laughs> wanted to gonna... throw throw one in here that's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um. So she was born in Hungary to the noble Bathory family around 1560. It's unknown her exact birth date, uh, just because they didn't keep track so well about females being born. So it was between 1560 and 1561, and her exact birthday is not known. Her father was Baron George Bathory, the sixth brother of... I don't... I I looked up how to pronounce this word. (laughs) The Voivode... Of Transylvania, Transylvania, <laughs> and Voivod. <laughs> um, Andrew um, bon- Bonaventura Bathory was the brother, <laughs> and I looked up what a Voivod was because I did not know. Uh, and I wrote in here in my notes, I have a feeling you'll ask what a Voivod is. <laughs> I, I was getting there. <laughs> um, it's a leader or ruler of a land of people but it's what they specifically called the leader, like a lord um, okay. uh, in Transylvania. So he was kind of like the king of Transylvania, but they didn't have kings. Mm. So it wasn't like, because at first I was thinking maybe it was like a viscount or something, but it's it's higher up than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's the top of that area, like that country region. That's, yeah. Huh. It was very unclear if Transylvania was an actual country or just a region when I, at this time when I was looking mm-hmm. it up because it was, like, traded around a little bit. Yeah. I blame Dracula. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> um, her mother and father were cousins by blood, which was pretty normal back then, uh, especially the royal family. So you got to keep it in the family. Yeah, can't get that money escape in everywhere else. Um, they did this to preserve the royal bloodline and keep it pure. <laughs> Tasty. We know, we know what that did. <laughs> um, and it wasn't seen as morally wrong or in any way ethically wrong until much later when we realized that it causes a lot of diseases. And it did in their daughter. <laughs> Elizabeth... She grew up with extreme wealth. They were, she can get anything she wanted. Um, Some things even said they had like a menagerie. They had everything. They had humans. They they had everything. Human (laughs) Uh, cattle. Human cattle. (laughs) And they had multiple palaces as well. Not just one castle. They had lots of palaces that she grew up in. Uh, so she yeah, she grew up in extreme wealth. She had a great education, and her parents really wanted her to be well educated. And she had a lot of social power as well. In school, she learned German, Latin, Greek, and Hungarian, and possibly some other languages as well. But those were the core that it was written down that she had learned. She seemed to have it all. But no amount of money can take away insecurities and what we believe to be possibly BDD that she had. Um, Which I can understand because I have BDD as well and I do not do what she does. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, She had some other physical health issues. She did have epilepsy. And um, it was said to be rather intense. She had multiple seizures and they were grand mal and multiple seizures a day. And it was very frequent. Uh, and epilepsy was very common among royal families because of, we learned later the mixed uh, <laughs> blood. Of course, epilepsy, that's not the only way you get it. It doesn't mean that you have incest in your background if you have epilepsy, <laughs> but it is more common in incestual families. Where the, where the, the sort of duplication of the genes causes mm-hmm. a lot of problems. Yeah. That's just one of them. <laughs> It's interesting that they knew all this stuff about her when, I mean, this is the 1500s and some of it, obviously they didn't call epilepsy back then, but they Mm -hmm. knew, you know, but like, it's it's interesting that they have like that much, I guess it's because she was rich. So she was more important. 
And she was part of medical studies. So because of her epilepsy, they brought in doctors from all over the world, which is part of the next part I'm going to talk about. But they brought in um, a lot of different medical professionals, and their science was a little wild back then, let me tell you. (laughs) And they had been doing the same thing since, like, what I looked back was about 400 AD. They had been using the same methods up until the 1560s when this started. And there wasn't an exact date when they started using these treatments on her, but it was believed she was around four or five years old when they started doing the treatments for epilepsy. Oh, these doctors. Um, So one thing that they would do is they would find somebody without epilepsy, drain some of their blood, and rub it on the lips of the person who has epilepsy, and they believed that that would slowly cure them of the epilepsy. That's imaginative. (laughs) Mm -hmm. The other one that they would do (laughs) is they would take the blood and part of the skull of a dead person who did not have epilepsy, crush it up, mix it together, make it into a, a little soup, and they would drink it. A little bone broth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a new one. I haven't heard that one. Yeah, before. yeah. Um, and I was like, where did they come up with this? So I looked into that as well. Yeah, like... Somebody decided, you know, it's almost like take, <laughs> taking the power <laughs> of your enemy and <laughs> into your body. <clears throat> oh, goodness. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was a little wild. I had never heard of that before. <laughs> My oldest has epilepsy, and I never did that. Mm. So, <laughs> Thank goodness for uh, modern medicine, even though it's still rather barbaric. It's not quite that barbaric. Yeah, it was shocking with my son is he was on a whole bunch of different anti um, seizure medications and it finally took a doctor prescribing him with marijuana, but it, it was mainly THC just, I'm sorry, mainly CBD with just enough THC to like activate it. And they were in honey sticks. The day after he started taking those, he hasn't had a single seizure since. It's like the Char- when the Charlotte's Web um, mm-hmm. strain come out, that's like... Some that's of the, very similar yes yeah some of the yep. studies that i read about that and um just the, the use cases were pretty incredible in terms of results yeah with a lot of different um ailments that were going on especially with the brain uh charlotte's web a lot of people moved to colorado just to get their kids onto charlotte's web legally yeah. and get them better and it helped so many people yeah. Uh, Nova was a little girl I was following for a long time. Her parents moved, I think, from Texas to Colorado, and she was having s- tons of seizures a day, and then she would go months without them um, on Charlotte's Web. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. That that little bit of THC with the CBD is where the mm-hmm. where the trick is. Like, if, if it's just straight CBD, a lot of times there's really no benefit. Yeah. Your body doesn't absorb it without the THC. Yeah. And you, you don't need... You don't need to feel it, just enough to activate it. Yeah. Just need those receptors hit. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, do that instead of blood, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of diseases in blood. <laughs> I'm surprised that Elizabeth lived so long. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, I looked up why they did this. And according to an article by Ferdinand Peter Moog and Axel Karenberg... Between the 1st and 6th century, a single theological and several medical authors reported on the consumption of gladiator's blood, or liver, to cure epileptics. The origins of the sacred or something properties of the blood of a, a slain gladiator likely l- lie in the type of funeral rites that they had. Although the influence of the religious background faded during the Roman Republic and the magic of blood continued for centuries. After the, the prohibit, um, prohibition of gladiator combats in the 400 AD, an, execu- oh, sorry, an executed individual particularly had been beheaded became the legitimate successor of a gladiator. 
Hmm. Huh. Um, so th- you're now a gladiator if you get your head head cut off, guys. <laughs> um, so that led to um, uh, occasionally. Um, It's been indicated in early modern textbooks on medicine, as well as reports in the popular literature of the 19th and early 20th century documents, the existence of this ancient magical practice until modern times. Spontaneous recovery from some forms of epilepsy may be responsible for the illusion of therapeutic effectiveness and the uh, confirming statements by physicians. The other thing I read is that because it was a long, years-long treatment of this blood thing, that people would grow out of epilepsy, and then they would just assume it was the blood that did it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's been going on since before 400 AD. That was just the first time a doctor had been seen using it. Before that, it was like a rite ceremony of gladiators that survived, or sorry, of the royal people higher ups in society eating the livers and drinking the blood of gladiators that were slain in front of them is fun (laughs) we will get the power we will eat them and get the power don't get me started on how i think football is basically the same thing but (laughs) oh yeah you 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 won't hear me disagreeing with you (laughs) even without hearing your point Oh, gosh. Uh, Yeah, so it was interesting to look that up and that it's been going on for so long, all the way up into, like, the 1800s. They were still doing that little blood blood and skull nonsense. You don't wonder how many people got sick from it. Oh, yeah. There's so many diseases in drinking blood. And the blood wasn't, like, cooked except for in that broth. But when there was other times that they would just drink the blood and then make a bone broth as well. Yeah. They're drinking just dead person's blood. Like, how long were they dead before you... Right? I mean, just... Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> oh, well. Moving I gotta, on. I gotta <laughs> think twice about the next time I bitch about some cough syrup. Right. <laughs> Tastes like pennies. <laughs> uh-huh. Her parents started getting these treatments for Elizabeth at a very young age, so like I said, about four or five years old, and historians think that these treatments being so regular and starting before her memories really took hold uh, may have been part of what triggered her obsession later on in life. But there were a lot of other people getting this treatment that didn't go on to do what she did, so... Yeah. It may just be one little aspect, but it was a pretty normal thing for people with seizures that could afford a doctor so yeah Uh, but elizabeth was not only raised wealthy and entitled but also religious by the age of 10 her parents betrothed her to be married to ferenc nad city (laughs) ferenc (laughs) Mad <laughs> city. And he was to become in the future when he wasn't, I believe, 14 years old at this time, um, chief and commander of the Hungarian troops in the war against the Ottomans. But he was also her cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of cousin stuff going on. Uh, you know those royal families trying to make sure the future of their power and wealth is secure as early yeah. as possible. Don't share with any outsiders. Being 10 and engaged. like, Yeah. Just weird. I, I know it was normal at that time for wealthy people to try to get in with another wealthy family and get their kids locked down as quickly as possible as soon as they knew they weren't going to die of like a really young child illness. Yeah. But 10 years old and knowing your future is already just there for you. It's weird. Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, we've gone like, like where adolescence lasts until the 20s now. So like we've gone, like people then would look at us and be like, wait, your kids are still kids when they're at old age? What? (laughs) Uh, I wrote about that in here too. (laughs) Um, Before they were married, when Elizabeth was 13 years old, um, it is believed that she gave birth to a child that was not her future husband's offspring. She did give birth to a child. It's just they're pretty sure it wasn't his. <laughs> um, it was rumored that the child's father was a peasant boy working for the family that Elizabeth had fallen for. Now, remember, 13 back then was an adult. 
they could get married and they could have children. And a lot of the poorer families were already married at that time and starting to have children. Yeah. So the age wasn't necessarily the problem. But looking back at it, psychologically, they're still 13-year-old children. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's nothing different about their hormones and their genetics. I mean, if anything, our children are more grown up just because of the weird hormones we have in our food than they were back then. They were still 13-year-old impulsive teenagers. They were not... (sighs) But yeah, having babies at that time wasn't the weird thing. It was that she wasn't married, and the family did not want anyone to know that. So what did they do when someone gives birth and they don't want anyone to know? They give away the child to someone else. Yeah. Which is another thing in her past that may have led to things in the future. But again, I know a lot of people who have given up children for adoption at a young age when their parents even forced them to and did not go on to do the things she goes (laughs) on to do. (laughs) Oh, gosh. It was also said that her family... um, Yeah, so they were really upset when they found out and scared of her daughter's chances of marrying... What was his name? Ferenc. Ferenc. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why they gave away the child. Um, and so their engagement went on. When Elizabeth was 15 and Ferenc. <laughs> Ferenc. <laughs> uh, I heard, so it was spelled the same way in everything. It's F-E-R-E-N-C. Ferenc. But... In some documentaries I was watching, they said Ferenek, but there's no E between the N and the C, and then others said Ferenc. So <laughs> I'm going with that one because there's no E. Um, he was 19, so he was four years older than her, which is not unusual then either. Usually they're even older. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, <sighs> they were, And they'd known each other since they were kids because they were related. <laughs> So they were married in one of the royal palaces in 1575. The royal religious wedding was elaborate, grand, and very long. Um, Have you seen a royal wedding? (laughs) No. (laughs) Days long. I have a really good friend who's obsessed with the royal family, and so we watched the last one, and it's like two days long. (laughs) Yeah. I There's have, no well, party. <laughs> my a friend who's sentient, they got married and it was like six days or something. It's like an ongoing, just like, you know, celebration type thing with like the ceremonial stuff. And mm-hmm. I was just like, um, do not invite me, please. <laughs> I don't want to. Six days. Yeah. Like, I, I can't people for that long. <laughs> yeah, that's just like a lot. I mean, it's it's it sounds like it's a great time for the people that enjoy that. But like, I that would be way too much for me. Can you imagine being the bride or groom who is an introvert and it's like not an enjoyable experience for you and you're supposed to be on display and. Right. Right. And and, in those cases and that those cultures like prearranged marriages aren't uncommon either. So you have like that stress too. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, So yeah, a typical wedding has about 150 guests. This wedding had 4,500 (laughs) <laughs> and I'm sure they knew every single one of them. <laughs> My cousins. <laughs> They're all cousins. <laughs> Just hitting on each other, you know. Yeah. Things are we, happening. They're like, and we have done them. We have done that. We haven't done them. <laughs> also, like, what do you get somebody getting married who has that much money? Like, what can you possibly give them? More land. It kind of seems like the only thing that would be like. Useful. Yeah. Um, yeah, they have ever. Yeah, yeah. Well, her husband gifted her his family castle. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty nice, I guess. Um, her family already had multiple palaces, but they actually ended up, she ended up living in this castle the rest of her life. So she really liked that castle. And um, part of his gift to her, or do I say this later? Maybe. Maybe I'll wait. Uh, Through this union, Elizabeth now had an even higher social and political standing among the people. She had the power of both families, families, 
<laughs> and then I wrote sides of her family. <laughs> I would, yeah. The blood is so mixed and weird in those royal families. Um, also coming from the Bathory side, she has seen as many, or sorry, she was seen as more prominent than him. She was actually higher up than Ferenc was. So he took her last name, which I had never heard of in this time period. So Hungary was like ahead of its time with the feminism there or equality or just or just uh symbolism for power maybe like you know yeah you go liz or not <laughs> because i probably not because of everything you go on to do uh, <laughs> so uh Ferenc loved working he he loved being in charge of those armies doing what armies do you keep them in your sleeveies <laughs> i didn't write that there that just came to me <laughs> Um, <laughs> I literally like it took me I literally was like wait how do you keep them in your sleeves and then I was like oh wait it's a wordplay thank you oh, <laughs> if the first time someone told me that joke I was like you so <laughs> <laughs> I just like oh. were they little like what yeah. an ant like, army the little, the little green the little green army guys Oh, gosh. Um, So after they were married, he'd be gone for months at a time overseeing the armies um, of their land and doing that Ottoman Empire thing. Uh, Elizabeth did not have... Oh, did I not write in here? I didn't. Okay, so I will say the thing I was going to say. Part of his wedding gift to her was that he made her a beautiful, gorgeous torture dungeon in the castle just for her to play with while he's gone wow what what did they talk about what did he know about her like exactly (laughs) i'm like and he said it says like to her specifications and everything so she did she tell him before they got married like i want this in the castle you're gonna give me the castle (laughs) but it sounds like he really did love her (laughs) Yeah, I mean, he could have said no, so he he didn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, so Elizabeth did not have idle hands while he would be gone. She (laughs) served over her multitude of estates and would manage the businesses and political affairs of the family. She was the lady of the castle land. Well, she was very important. (laughs) She did things. <laughs> and apparently, in the beginning, she did hold everything together really well and was a very good leader and was able to keep everything turning and running and no one knew what else she was doing. So she had a lot of time on her hands. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, she was a busy bee. Um, she did get a lot of work done and did keep the people in order as well as apparently kept the castle and workers organized and on task themselves. She was never called lazy from any documents that I read. It said that she just kept going. Um, People were pretty impressed with her work ethic and skills because she was new to the castle when she came in. It was run by the other side of her family. (laughs) Um, And there were no documents that said she'd ever been there before the wedding. Um, On top of all of her daily life duties, she was said to bring many lovers home. (laughs) She was said to always keep her marriage bed warm while her husband was away, working for months at a time. And it kind of seems like he knew this was going on and was okay with it. Like, nothing said... Like, everyone knew. All the workers. She was open about it. She wasn't yeah. beheaded. <laughs> I wonder if that's just, like, a cultural difference for that yeah. for that area or something, that there's a tolerance for that. I would say with the last name stuff, probably. Yeah, ladies have needs, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, where was I at? Yeah, there it is. Um, I just wrote there. Ferenc seemed to be okay with all of this, as well as her other hobbies, and participated in those. <laughs> not not the men. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 was, I went to the torture dungeon. Yeah, yeah, you, you went to the right place. 
Um, I do not know if he was scared of losing her uh, since she was technically more powerful than him and brought him more armies and um, led a lot more political uh, power over more land because she was there or why maybe he just really was into the same twisted stuff as her. But it seemed like he was on the same page as her with everything she did. It's believed to be to have been consensual between the two of them, at least. <laughs> but Elizabeth toned her hobbies down when he was there and got a lot darker when he was gone. I don't know if it's because she was sad he was away and that's why it got darker, or if it was just because she didn't want to show him how horrible she actually was. <clears throat> so... I'm assuming she was open with all of her little tricks with Ferenc before the marriage because of that castle being built, or the dungeon being built for her, specifically. Um, and, ugh, I keep getting messages, and it's, like, flashing in front of where I'm thinking. <laughs> Distraction. There's a group chat that I'm in that I should probably mute. <laughs> um, now, this dungeon was not a red room like the Fifty Shades of Grey crowd would like to believe. There were no willing victims. There were no consent agreements or safe words. This was a legit torture chamber of every single device that was out there at the time, including household things that she just decided to use as well. It was not sexy. It, it might have been for her, but it was not sexy for the people in visiting. Definitely not. Definitely not. Um, she kept on her torture and murder, um, as well as her affairs, through the 25 years of marriage with Ferenc. So at this time, she was about 40 when, when Ferenc actually passed away, 25 years into their marriage. The dates were a little wonky when I was looking it up, because some it looked like they were married for 30 years, some 25. The death dates were a little weird. Um, so it was either 25 or 30 years that they were married. And um, so it's not it's not definitive how he died because science, but yeah. <laughs> his legs got super painful for about three years before he died, and uh, they he ended up being completely like disabled the last year of his life before he died, and they knew it was happening. They knew he was slipping away. Um, it's not speculated that Elizabeth had anything to do with it. Because they actually did have a really good relationship, apparently. Uh, some people want to believe so because of the other stuff she did. But men weren't really her M.O. So, <laughs> And he allowed her to do whatever she wanted. It's not like he was holding her back. Yeah. He was gone most of the time. Um, and she never remarried after him. So I don't think it was for any reason like that. But Elizabeth held all the power after he passed. And it's unclear if it was from grief or if it was because she did not have to hide what she was doing at all anymore, if she was hiding a part of what she did from him, but she got way worse after he died. Um, so yeah, she was able to unleash her, her absolute worst on people as often as she wanted now. Her methods became more brutal and her victims were in pain in for pain that would make them beg and pray for death just to escape um, Elizabeth's games. She liked trying out different devices and methods on people depending on how she felt that day. Hmm. And how do we know this? Because she wrote about it in her journal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then yeah. she just she just picked like people at random. It wasn't like Oh, you know, we're about to get shoot. into that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, th actually, the very next sentence. The victims she picked <laughs> were mostly always girls. There's a couple that appeared to be men that may have just gotten in the way. Um, and some older girls that may she may not have known their ages until after she had them. But she really liked girls between the ages of 10 and 14. Um, it started out with peasant girls. Those less likely to be missed by society, although their families probably beg to differ about that. Yeah. Um, she would capture them while working in the castle, 
or a, around the courtyard, and she had some helpers, which we'll talk about a little bit later, who would also capture them so that she wasn't the only one around when they would go missing. So she could be doing something prominent and, like, in public view, and then they go missing during that time. Um, it's terrible. Um, so, yeah, they were rarely... So the families would talk out about it, and people were talking about their assumptions that Elizabeth had something to do with it. They didn't know if they were being killed or anything like that. They thought they were being taken for some other reason, but they had, they thought Elizabeth had something to do with it or someone in the castle did, but no one would listen to the servants and the, the peasants about that. The working class. Yeah. Naturally. Um, So after her husband died, she was bored of the unmissed peasants and wanted to move on to something a little riskier. She hatched a plan to take the daughters of the higher up social class under her wing into her castle. She thought that this would last, or sorry, how she thought this would last long is beyond me because they're going to be missed. (laughs) Right. Um, so she made a women's quarters to teach as a, as a widow to teach young girls how to have etiquette and class. And she would bring in tutors to teach these girls and slowly they would just go missing. That's not, not a great plan. You know, it's like if one every few years. Yeah. Oh, we'll get into how many. We'll get into (laughs) how many went missing. Um, There's only a record of 20 years of this, but she was doing it a lot longer than 20 years. I will tell you that. Wow. Um, But she these these children, the noble children in this program she had, were from far away, so they weren't able to write back as often, um, and it's thought that she would write letters on their behalf to their families even after they were gone and it was Mm -hmm. harder to go and see your family and they pretty much were there until they were going to get married and then get married off anyways and then they would just die of a random disease (laughs) (laughs) so that was her plan (laughs) And this plan did go for a little while. Uh, she she did get away with that for, for a couple years. Um, and that's not how she got caught. <laughs> so, yeah, she would take... She had four people that were helping her get the girls and take them down into the torture chambers. And then she would torture them. Um she grew even more sadistic towards these girls. Like she had more hatred or something towards these girls. She had a pleasure in causing them pain and suffering. It is said that, um, that this was Elizabeth's only true joy and entertainment. Something to pass the time is what her journal (laughs) said. That's a hobby. (laughs) Usually these sessions would start with severe beatings burning or mutilation of the hands she liked to use red hot irons and other metal household items to burn and scar her victims yes scar them because she kept them in there that long that their wounds would start to heal some were actually in there so long that they would either they would starve to death because she wouldn't feed them and but she would give them water and she would just watch them starve to death and like write in her journal how they were doing yeah that was part the of the time. torture. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I scooted down. <laughs> I'm close. I'm close. I'm close. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> I'm almost there. Okay. She would bite them through the flesh, especially on their faces and arms and breasts She would also occasionally freeze or starve them to death. Um, I don't know why this particular one gives me the heebie-jeebies, but she would also jam pins under their fingernails. Yeah, I don't. That's. (laughs) I was waiting for that too, like it because it's such a, such a thing with torture. The it's awful. Ugh. 
She enjoyed cutting or biting off body parts, especially the breasts, and have the victims prepare, cook, and eat their own body parts. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh... (laughs) (laughs) Like, very, uh, you know, early Hannibal of her. Mm -hmm. Some victims, though, when they were getting close to death, she would cover them in honey, tie them to a table... And watch the ants eat away at them while they were still alive. Huh. I want to know if she came up with all these things herself or if she had advisors, like, telling her. Yeah. Or she, like, she referenced a this. book that someone else, some other journal or, you know. Mm. Yeah. Those English. Their <laughs> torture. <laughs> right. It is no real surprise that some of this torture would be directed to their sensitive regions. Um, And a lot of historians as well as psychologists that have gone through their, her background and everything believe that some of this was sexually motivated, even though there's no real proof of her doing any, like pleasuring herself or anything like that during the time or sexually assaulting them besides, um, hurting them yeah but with the way that she went about doing things a lot of these things seem sexually motivated in some way shape or form um but yeah she definitely preyed on youth because of their innocence and um their virginity but she but also for another reason too which i get into later and um yeah, so and then I nothing really happened in her life that we know of that really caused all of this. It's possible, like some people say that it could be the seizures themselves causing damage to certain parts of the brain. Um, other aspects could be possibly a head injury that happened, or she just could be psychotic. Yeah, <laughs> for no other reason. Sometimes that just happens. Yeah. Um. I told them I'm recording right now. In the group chat, they're like, are you going to join us over at the brewery? And I'm like, I am recording right now. So if you're listening to this, I'm not napping like you guys are talking about. (laughs) You're doing a Um, thing. I'm doing a thing. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah. Uh, she didn't have there's no other children that she had or anything like that on the record it's it's not believed she had any other children beside that one that was given away um and the baby that she did have seemed to be with a willing partner not an older person who took advantage of her and there's nothing in her journals or anything like that that talks about any trauma that occurred besides the baby that was given away Um, so, oh, so this is the part that a lot of people have heard of. Once she was done with the victims, she would take the bodies, drain them of blood, and she would pour the blood into a goblet and would drink it. It's believed because she wrote it down. Um, she did this to continue helping her epilepsy as well as to keep her skin young and vital and beautiful and vibrant. And she thought that drinking the blood of these young girls would keep her youthful and young, that she was taking their youth. Yeah. That, like, see it in TV a lot, like witches take baths in blood or or whatever. There used to be rumors that she would bathe in their blood, but there's no historical proof of that. But that is where they get it from is her for those stories. Uh, she was called Countess of Blood and Countess Dracula <laughs> because of this. Um, it's said that between 1590 and 1610, Elizabeth's private journal estimated she had taken, tortured, murdered, and drank the blood of over 650 girls in 20 years. That's over 32 girls a year. Wow. That's, that's like... It's like she took a few weeks off for vacation, but otherwise it was almost weekly. (laughs) She had multiple at a time because it took her weeks to torture and kill them all. Sometimes months. So when um, 
there's certain accounts that she had three or four at a time, typically, that she was torturing in the same room. And one that she hadn't started torturing yet would be watching the the one that other ones that were being tortured so they knew what was in store for them. That's... She So she liked them knowing that they're going to be tortured and sitting there. Yeah. That's very <sighs> generous of her. Yeah. <laughs> Um, She was clear through her journals that she believed she was always going to get away with it. She really, she was a narcissist. She thought that she knew better than everyone else, that she was noble enough, rich enough, powerful enough, that no one would do anything even if they knew. Because people had been talking about it for over 20 years, and she had not been caught. Yeah. Um, Once 1610 came along, she was again wanting to change things up. You know, serial killers. They like to, like, amp it up. (laughs) Um, They always have to progress things. Got to get that dopamine. Got to get the next fix. (laughs) Exactly. I put in here, just like an addict. Yeah. (laughs) It'll it'll never be enough. Um, Her four collaborators started abducting local noble children. I don't know how she thought she was going to get away with that because the nobles in her area have power. And they talk to each other, and their children are marrying each other's children. Or right. each other. Um, this was even different from the socialites that she was taking the children in from, because those were distant, and these were local. Um, they had money and knew their daughters were missing right away. Uh, most were probably already betrothed because of their ages to other noble children. Because remember, she was 10 when she got proposed or not proposed whatever engaged her hand yeah engaged (laughs) on top of this the nobles talk to each other they are probably the yeah the ones marrying off their sons to the daughters that are going missing um they started talking and trying to figure out what was going on they had a bunch of meetings and they were they were really sure something very horrible was going on they didn't know their daughters were dead they that wasn't their thought they thought they were being abducted for some other reason there was going to be a ransom coming or something like that um but there were a lot of their daughters missing on december 10th 1610 so she only did this for about a year of the the local nobles yeah count count giorgi thurzo (laughs) Um, who was someone who was close to Elizabeth's family and had known her her whole life. He was also the top person in the judicial system in all of Hungary. Um, so he's like the, the high judge, the, the lawmaker. Um, he decided to look into things since the nobles had been mentioning they um, thought the castle and or Elizabeth had something to do with it. He was hoping they were not true, so he wanted to go in and investigate and figure out what was going on, but he also was expecting to go in there and find out that it wasn't accurate. So, especially since he had also earlier heard the rumors of the castle and what was going on from servants, but did nothing about it because they're peasants. Yeah. They don't they don't deserve safety and children. Um, Well, Thurzo, he goes to the castle, which he had been to many times, and he looks for Elizabeth, and he hears a noise going on, and so he goes to investigate it. The door was ajar, and he looks in, and he sees Elizabeth, as well as a girl tied up to a board on the wall, another girl sitting in a chair tied up. And what looked like another dead body of a girl in the room. <laughs> I think he had people with him because he yeah. did get at, he did get out and he realized what was going on and that it was accurate. And um, he wrote back to his wife. There's a letter uh, that I actually could see that he wrote back to his wife, not in English, but it was interpreted. Uh, that he discovered the one girl being tortured, the other already dead, and one more waiting to be tortured. He went to his judicial authorities. Um, So I'm assuming Elizabeth didn't see him at this time and he escaped without her noticing. And he told them everything he had seen in the investigation, discovered her four accomplices, 
as well. All five of them were arrested. Um, they found um, everyone else who had assisted in her, her, including people who dug graves, who moved bodies, who cleaned up after everything, most likely terrified that the same thing would happen to them if they didn't do it. And they arrested all of them as well. Um, those arrested were tortured and of course they were tortured too. <laughs> um, and questioned until all the information and the stories were kind of the same. Yeah. Or at least pieces fit together of what different people knew. Um, everyone found to have helped her in any way were sentenced to death. Um, even those who were forced to help her out of fear and were victims themselves. And a lot of them, their daughters had been victims as well. Or they were told their daughters wouldn't be a victim if they helped them. Mm -hmm. um, the officials had no issues quickly executing the servants and others who helped Elizabeth, but they did not know what to do with Elizabeth herself because she's royalty and they can't execute her like they would anyone else. Her family could not be put on trial because that would make the country and the power seem weak and bring negative things, possibly even war to the country. Servants who had already come forward and weren't believed um, were now put on trial instead. So they were the ones brought in to tell their stories of what happened. And um, so the people who lost their own daughters, saw girls being taken, they were all brought up for questioning. Um, no one had clear answers to the exact number of girls, but it's believed that what she wrote in her diary is accurate. That it is at the time when she wrote that was 650 in the last 20 years which is probably more than that over the whole time she was doing this. Yeah. Or, And it's not clear what date that diary entry was, if it was before more happened. Yeah. Um, but since they couldn't execute her, what they did is they imprisoned her in her own castle. They put her in a room. They bricked up the windows in that room and put guards outside of the door at all hours. Um, and it's said that she was not to leave the room for the rest of her days, but there are rumors that she was allowed outside with supervision. <laughs> um, but on the evening of August 20th, 1614, so she was in prison for four, less than four years. Yeah. Three and a half years. <laughs> um, Elizabeth complained of her hands being cold, and the guards did not fetch her a doctor, but told her to go to sleep and sleep it off. And she died peacefully in her sleep bummer <laughs> she, why did she get the easy way out what the heck I don't know like I understand <laughs> that they couldn't kill her I understand politically why they couldn't do that but goodness I feel like I feel like getting justice it would have been a show of strength not a show of weakness to be like hey Especially accountability if her own family, if her own family came forward and said kill her I feel yeah. like that would have been powerful. Yeah, exactly. But, like, I don't know why, like, personal accountability is not held in high regard because, like, it's, like, one of the hardest things for people to do. So, to me, that that just mm -hmm. makes it a show of strength. Yeah, exactly. Weird. That's so, like, just all those lives, especially in that, that age group, snuffed out those are all like lives that were going to go on to have kids and mm -hmm. you know there's like entire line lineages that don't exist anymore because because of that exactly especially since they could take the woman's last name <laughs> 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 oh but yeah i i wanted to do that story i was going to do it much later um she's fascinated me since i was like 10 years old but <laughs> <laughs> what a year for her to come into my mind but uh actually i got led to her because i was reading some dracula books i was a reader and i read books way above my grade level yeah same and reading history about the story of dracula uh led me to her and she's fascinating <laughs> Oh. Yeah, definitely, like, it's also interesting just, like, to have, like, these records of, of someone that is so far in the past and we can only really get, like, snippets and then pieces of people's assumptions and, like, mm -hmm. you know, but 
they made such a you know it's like it's like the modern day serial killers um that will will stick around in our history way more than like a lot mm-hmm. of other people that we think we're going to stick around because there's that that fascination and that that fear but the sheer numbers you know like people cannot you know at least in like the our culture and our country cannot get away with that there's probably places where people aren't still aren't accounted for as well where you could still get away with higher numbers but um yeah so like now we have a serial killer that manages to get into the 20s or whatever it's like dang you know and they do they actually do have syndicates that get away with high numbers um I forget what country it's in. I learned about it on from Mr. Ballin. I really like his podcast. But there was, gosh, I think it's South America. Um, there are some syndicates of people who harvest organs from people. So they'll kidnap people. They hold them in a warehouse. They'll take the organs that they need that aren't going to kill them. And then they leave them there until there's an organ they need that will kill them. And they'll take the rest. And... So there's just people waiting in a warehouse for organs to be taken. And there's like hundreds of people just sitting in the warehouses and they found some of them. And then when they go back, cause they're like in the middle of nowhere to get the body or get the people out, they've all been taken somewhere else and it keeps it's happening. Crazy. Yeah. And they take people, the, a lot of them that are being taken are Uber drivers in some of these countries because they don't have a legit job that they have to show up for. So if they don't show up for Uber, there's nothing like that's going to happen to them and they can just not take jobs or take rides. And then, so no one knows for a while and their family thinks that they're out working Yeah, and they, and then they go missing and, um, and they don't know for a long time. So it's scary. It's scary. Like, what an awful, just like, just an awful experience to be sitting there basically waiting to die. Yeah. Because, and that's you know, today. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. And that and stuff doesn't even make the news the way that like serial killers do or whatever. Because the police are in on it. And, and so it's like they get tipped off that the police are going to be coming. So to clear it out before they get there. So then they're just like, oh, well, it's empty now. <laughs> <laughs> they must have done something with the people and they're just gone. Magic. We're not, we're not going to look into that anymore. <laughs> uh, but yeah, things like that do happen, but it's not an individual person. It's a group of people doing it. So in, an individual getting away with stuff like that at, in those numbers is not likely to happen pretty much anywhere um, unless they're just allowed to do it in front of people and take people in like yeah. in certain countries that they're allowed to still torture people or whatever yeah. but that's seen not as murder <laughs> <laughs> yeah I see it as murder <laughs> yeah murders it's always it is murder murder is murder but yeah mm-hmm. exactly oh, sh- should I find something else funny to end it on <laughs> <laughs> cleanse the palate <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, because that story is dark. Um, the next one I'm going to do is not as not dark at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's another woman in history who did amazing things. <laughs> and then we do have a guest that's going to be um, recording with us soon that is getting us her schedule. And she has a crazy dark story, too. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll just mix that in there between some light ones. Yeah. <laughs> Balance it out. All right. Let's see. Funny news. Funny news. I want to know what happened with those bunnies. Bunnies. Let's see. Funny and weird news. Mm-hmm. That's not funny. Oh, that's. This isn't funny. But the closest, I think it's the closest zoo to me, had a a museum of taxidermy of animals from mainly Africa, of course. But they were degrading so much, it came up on here. No. Uh, (laughs) 
but the way they used to do taxidermy when it starts degrading is very toxic so they had to get rid of it so they're going to put something else in there now Hmm. but that's on the funny news thing and that's not funny it's not really funny um longest alligator in mississippi history was caught i think i saw that one how long is he <laughs> is a Chi- China authorities arrest two for smashing shortcut through Great Wall with es- excavator. <laughs> How big of a did they get all the way through? <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. Um, China's Great Wall has been pierced by Genghis Khan, the Manchus, and now allegedly a couple of construction workers named Zhang and Wang who wanted a shortcut. <laughs> I'm sorry, but like. The names the ways too. Yeah. <laughs> like a duo. <laughs> I need to get to um, work. <laughs> the area of the breach was a broken down section far from the restored segments most Chinese and forest, foreign tourists are familiar with. Um, it says the government of UU County, hundreds of kilometers west of Beijing, show a dirt road cut through a section of the wall against a rural landscape, along with the two suspects, uh, uh, Zhang and Wing. And um, they wanted a shorter route for some construction work they were doing in nearby towns. <laughs> it literally, like, tore down a 2,000 year old wall just to, just to shortcut. Oh my gosh. Wow. I wonder what, they didn't say what kind of trouble they're going to get into, but I'm guessing it's not it's not small trouble. No, especially in China. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Oh my gosh. Well, the alligator in Mississippi was 802.5 pounds. Eight, wait, eight, how how much? Eight, say that again? Eight, 802 and a half pounds. Wow. That's, that's a big alligator. Right? It doesn't say how long it was. Oh, 14 feet and three that's, inches. That's a lot of boots. <laughs> big. That's a yeah. big alligator. Not so that I'm suggesting we should make boots out of them. I'm just saying it's a lot of boots. That that's is scary. huge. Uh, when I lived and in it, Florida, they were all and small. it's smiling. It's smiling for the photo. It's, all- it's also dead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, then maybe it is a lot of boots if it's already dead, you know. Yeah. The hunters captured and killed it. That's rude. That is rude. There's not a lot of funny... There's not a lot of funny news. You guys need to do funnier things so it gets on the news. Right. But not like criminal stuff, just funny stuff. Yeah. Like going to Walmart and taking over their PA with a big fart. That would be funny. That would be funny. (laughs) And impressive. Yes. Yes. So if any of you work for Walmart, okay, not if you work there. If you're already quitting. Take control of the PA for a day. Yeah. <laughs> Just rip one. And then, like, hear people in the background going, ee hee hee hee. Uh, yep. Well, we love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's possible we might have some ads starting our next recording. I have two that are getting back to me now, including Poppy. Oh, that would be exciting. Yeah, and Lumi. So those are the two that I'm waiting on right now, which we've already talked about. So you're welcome for free advertising. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I talked about I talked about the Lumi in my RV podcast or uh, videos as well because like I was like working and I was like, oh wait, I forgot the Lumi. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> I, I always have it in my backpack. <laughs> Just in case. And it doesn't melt. Um, I had one. The stick... W- or sorry. No, I loom- my Lumi has never melted. 
Um, I had a different natural one. I think it was like, ah, can't remember the brand. Tom's maybe? And it melted all over. I went to go put it on and it was like, I use the cream version. I don't use the spread. Yeah, Yeah. so I I have to get it on my hand, but. I have both, but. You find one works better than the other, or? Um, I, I like the stick one for, like, my armpits. And then I use the cream one after, like, I take a shower, like, everywhere else. Under my boobs. And in the crevasses. <laughs> the crevasse. <laughs> everywhere that like and it's it's not so much for smell as it is for anywhere that chafes cuz it like prevents that too cuz i wear a lot of dresses oh, so yeah. my thighs i put it like on my thighs and they don't chafe cuz I, I should got, try that I got powerful thighs cuz i don't like i only put it on my underarms i've never but i should cuz i have a lot of issues with with chafe. i put holes in my pants like mm-hmm. really quickly because of my thighs so we got I, those nice, powerful thighs, guys. Rrr. Thick thighs <laughs> save lives. <laughs> uh, well, I hate to cut this a little short, but I have family only here for today, and then they leave, and they want me to come down to a festival going on. That was the group chat that I just read. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take the kids down there so they can dance to live music and I can sit there and probably have one seltzer yeah. I'll send, send you a video of me pouring the color into it again <laughs> awesome have, a, <laughs> have fun I will and thank you all for joining us on this beautiful journey of this wonderful <laughs> woman <laughs> And I will put both of our Patreons in the description. Uh, So if you want to support us in any way, even the smallest tier, you guys, helps a ton. Because we have a lot of different subscription subscription services we both have to pay for, for us to be able to do this. And honestly, 10 of you in our lowest subscription box pays for like two of those subscriptions. So... Exactly. If you think you can't give a lot and it's just a little bit, and we will announce you on here, (laughs) um, it really does help. Even if you think it's just a little bit of money, it a little bit from a few people goes a long way. So, um, you guys are what make this possible, and we appreciate you and love you and all those things that we're supposed to say. Wink, wink. Um, But yeah, join us. And uh, thank you for coming and meeting with us in the crow's nest. Crows out. Arr.